the English Channel, the world's busiest shipping lane. Every day, tens of thousands cross it by ferry. It's a safe, routine trip. Until one ship capsizes, just over a kilometer outside port. Within 90 seconds, hundreds of people are fighting for their lives in the icy water. 193 die in Britain's worst maritime accident since the Titanic. Now, with advanced computer simulations, we reveal exactly what went wrong on the Herald of Free Enterprise. Disasters don't just happen, they're a chain of critical events. <laughs> Europe, Belgium, Zeebrugge. Ferries from England and Germany sail in and out of this bustling North Sea port every day. March 6th, 1987, a chilly winter's day. The Herald of Free Enterprise, an 8,000-ton car and passenger ferry owned by the European shipping company Townsend Torreson, arrives from Dover. She's made the four-and-a-half-hour journey across the English Channel safely thousands of times. The Herald is on a tight schedule. She must complete four crossings every day. And between each trip, her crew must offload passengers and vehicles, clean the ship, and then reload for the next trip, all in the space of 90 minutes. Today, the Herald is just barely staying on schedule. 4 p.m. Assistant bosun Mark Stanley finishes up cleaning the car deck, ready for the return trip to England. He's been on duty for more than five hours, but will get an hour-long break before the ship sails for home. While the Herald's crew works hard, her passengers savor the last hours ashore, enjoying the shops, restaurants and cheap alcohol of continental Europe. <laughs> Most are British tourists, like 19-year-old bartender Simon Osborne. He's on a day trip to Belgium with a group of friends. We spent the afternoon on a pub crawl, you know, from bar to bar around Ostend. It was a really good day, a good, a good lad, lad's day out. They order one last round of drinks. Soon, they'll be leaving to sail home on the Herald. Four thirty p.m. Assistant bosun Mark Stanley completes his duties and heads to a crew cabin for his break. He won't be needed on the car deck again until just before the ship sails at 6 p.m. On the bridge, the Herald's captain, David Lurie, who has 10 years' experience commanding ships. He double-checks his route home across the channel. It'll be his second crossing of the day. By 5 p.m., cars and trucks are starting to roll onto the Herald's lower car deck through her giant bow doors. A cut-price ticket deal means the ship will be at capacity tonight and the crew have just one hour to complete loading. Once the lower deck is full, the crew must load the upper car deck. But there's a problem. The loading ramp at Zeebrugge doesn't reach the upper car deck. To reduce the gap, the captain must lower the ship in the water. He does this by pumping seawater into her ballast tanks. After 30 minutes, the ship sits one meter lower in the water. Only now can loading of the upper deck begin. The cheap ticket deal means the ship is packed with passengers too. Tonight, there are 459 on board. 5.30 p.m. Michael and Maureen Bennett, their 20-year-old daughter Teresa and her boyfriend, make their way home after a day out by the seaside. Teresa arranged the outing to mark a special family occasion for her mother and father. 
It was our wedding anniversary on the 1st of April and Teresa thought it'd be nice to, to take us out. We walked along the Ostend Harbour, uh, all around the lovely shops there. We really had a smashing time over there. Five forty five PM. Fifteen minutes to departure. The crew struggles to load the upper car deck in time. First officer Leslie Sable is in charge of loading and he's feeling the heat. Turnarounds are so tight that even a short hold up here could throw out the Herald schedule for subsequent crossings. Crew member Lee Cornelius is hard at work. It's always a bit of a rush at the end. Cars turn up just before you sail in and fill the ship up. Five fifty-seven. The crew finally finishes loading, but they're too late. The Herald will not depart on schedule tonight. Lee Cornelius places the safety chain across the bow doors. First Officer Sable tells Captain Lurie that loading is complete. OK, loading complete. Copy that. Then he heads for his position on the bridge. Stations or stations. Herald of Free Enterprise is about to leave the harbour, proceeding outwards. The announcement Harbour Stations calls crew members to their posts for departure. Lee Cornelius leaves the car deck to report to his station. 6.05 p.m. Captain Lury starts up the ship's three 9,000 horsepower engines. They're five minutes late. But weather reports say the channel is calm with only a light wind. He might be able to make up the time on the crossing. Michael and Maureen Bennett go to the restaurant on sea deck to grab a bite to eat. Spirits are high among the homeward bound passengers. It was a happy atmosphere on board. It was, you know, everybody had enjoyed themselves. Their daughter Teresa and her boyfriend are also on sea deck, relaxing in the lounge area. We got a drink. We just sat talking um, about the, the crossing back. I don't really like travelling on boats, so it's quite a big thing for me to, to travel out there anyway. The Herald steams out of Zeebrugge Harbour. She's now heading out into the icy waters of the North Sea. 19-year-old Simon Osborne leaves his friends in the cafeteria. He goes to the perfume counter on sea deck to buy a gift for his girlfriend. 6.24 p.m. As the ship approaches the outer harbour, Captain Lurie accelerates up to 18 knots, the maximum speed permitted. There's a party atmosphere among the homeward bound passengers. Then, out of the blue, the ship lurches violently, throwing Simon Osborne off balance. Very suddenly there was a jolt and the woman turned round and kind of stared at me and started screaming. In the cafeteria, people think nothing of it. Government worker Michael Reynolds recalls the scene. You heard the other person say, cheers, you know, with a, a typical British sense of humour. The ship stabilises and everything returns to normal. The passengers go back to having fun. But down below, on the ship's car deck, something is terribly wrong. Just over a kilometre outside Zeebrugge Harbour, something is desperately wrong on the Townsend Torreson ship, the Herald of Free Enterprise. The Herald starts to veer off course. Captain Lurie wrestles with the controls, but she's not responding. Then on E deck, the lower car deck, a crew member alerts one of the assistant purses. There's a big problem water. Vast amounts of it pour down the stairs from the upper car deck. The purser races up the stairs to sea deck where there's a radio. 
He desperately tries to call the bridge, but there's no response. Six twenty-eight p.m. Now a massive jolt. This time the ship tilts a full thirty degrees to the left. Before Captain Leary can issue a mayday call, the tilting ship throws him to the floor. The fall knocks him unconscious. As the ship tilts, English couple Michael and Maureen Bennett struggle to hold onto their table in the cafeteria. The sensation you get is like somebody is pulling a rug from underneath you. You can't get any hold. You can't hold onto anything. The 8,000-ton ship now starts to roll over. 19-year-old Simon Osborne loses his footing. I was sliding down. It was as if literally the world had been turned upside down. The only thing that was stopping me from going over because the tables were strapped to the floor. If the tables had shifted, I would have gone. As the Herald of Free Enterprise capsizes, there's a terrible grinding noise. Now the seawater breaks through the ship's portholes. I was standing there, rooted to the bottom, staring at this wall of white water coming towards me. And I thought then, you're going to die. The ship's sinking, and you're going to die. Thousands of tons of water gush into the ship under huge pressure. It's just like having a fire hose fitted on you, really. It just pushed you back up the boat. Michael Bennett's wife, Maureen, can't swim. He's desperately trying to keep her head above water. But the rushing torrent makes it harder and harder for Michael to keep his grip. I really, really panicked. I just panicked. I knew I was going to die. I had Maureen, my hand on her bra and her clothes, holding on tight to her. And that's the only way I could keep hold of her until that water had settled down. Otherwise, she would have been gone. The ferry's entire left side sinks into the North Sea, leaving only its right flank visible above the water. In a stroke of luck, the ship comes to rest on a sandbank. The sandbank stops it from sinking further, at least for now. At the edge of the harbor, the Belgian vessel Sanderis dredges the shipping channel. She's about one kilometer from the Herald. Her crew sees the bright lights of the Herald flicker and then go out. They radio Zeebrugge port controller Guido Derudaire. Derudaire immediately issues a mayday, requesting all nearby boats to rush to the aid of the stricken ship. Andre Papp is the skipper of the tugboat Seahorse. As soon as he receives the port controller's call, he and his crew rush to the ferry. Inside the flooded Herald, more than 500 passengers and crew fight for survival. A dazed Michael Bennett struggles to keep his wife Maureen afloat in the freezing water. The Bennett's daughter, Teresa, finds herself alone in another part of the ship. Her leather coat fills with air and acts like a makeshift light jack. But now, people struggling in the water below her try to grab her to stay afloat. You could feel people holding onto your coat, holding onto your trousers, and literally trying to climb over you. One of the worst things is you've got someone holding onto you, and then all of a sudden it's gone. Passengers who manage to survive 
now face another deadly enemy, hypothermia. You start to think, are you going to get out? Are we going to die? The North Sea water is just a few degrees above freezing. At these temperatures, most people will lose consciousness in just 20 minutes. A glass partition traps government employee Michael Reynolds. To keep his head above water, he stands on the side of a chair fixed to the floor. Water inside the ship continues to rise rapidly. There's no more than 18 inches of air. And I, and I, I remember thinking if we go any deeper, then you know, that, that, is, that is it. Six forty PM. Twelve minutes since the Herald keeled over. The rescue tugboat Seahorse nears the eight thousand ton ship. The tugboat crew break windows to get to the panicking passengers trapped below. Six forty three. Fifteen minutes since the capsize. The water levels finally stabilize. Teresa Bennett has no idea where her parents and boyfriend are. She shivers. The water is just three degrees Celsius. The water was very, very cold indeed. Your body just shuts down. If Teresa isn't rescued in the next five minutes, she risks losing consciousness. Drowning would then be inevitable. Towards the stern of the ship, Teresa's parents also struggle against the cold. 35 minutes after the Herald capsizes, Coast Guard helicopters help pick up survivors. Rescue ships continue to arrive. Local divers turn up to offer help. It's extremely dangerous to dive inside an unstable ship, but they know they are the survivors' only chance. Belgian Pete Lagaste is a diver from a local salvage company. He makes his way through floating bodies and debris, calling out to people in the darkened ship. Is alive? Enough. With the lights, we saw that the people in the water were moving. We also saw people in the water who were motionless, who had probably died, but we went for the people who were moving, who put up their arms or called, because you know these people are still alive. Further along sea deck, Simon Osborne is all alone. His friends are nowhere to be seen. All around him, silence has fallen. There were these people shouting, screaming, and as time went on, it became less and less. A diver reaches an exhausted and frozen Michael and Maureen Bennett. Rescuers throw a rope down to them. They're just in time. As they pull Maureen up to safety, she loses consciousness. Michael Reynolds is trapped behind a glass partition. He hears rescuers in the distance, but they can't see him. And then, a glimmer of hope. A rescuer appears on the other side of the glass. And he threw himself onto the glass a few times, and eventually the glass shattered. Now an exhausted Simon Osborne hears glass breaking. Realizing rescuers may be close, he swims towards the noise. Then one of the divers spots him. It was on being pulled out of the ferry that I kind of let go. And it's a dreadful, dreadful, dreadful state. Shark, you know, I was in deep, deep shark. Nine p.m. It's two and a half hours since the Herald capsized. Divers are still finding survivors. 
but dead bodies are starting to outnumber the living. 11.30. Diver Pete Lagasse has now been on the Herald of Free Enterprise for four and a half hours. He's losing all hope of finding any more survivors. On shore, 35 ambulances rush the wounded to nearby hospitals. Just hours earlier, Maureen and Michael Bennett were celebrating their ninth wedding anniversary. They now lie side by side in a hospital ward with serious injuries. Maureen is frantic with worry about her missing 20-year-old daughter, Teresa. I still was worrying where the heaven Teresa was. I just couldn't get that out of my mind. Where was she? Where was she? Two forty-five a.m. More than eight hours since the capsize. Now the tide starts to rise rapidly. It creates dangerous currents inside the ship. Rescuers must suspend diving until dawn and the ebb tide. Any hope of finding any more survivors disappears. Many friends and families separated during the capsize learned their loved ones did not survive. Others face an agonizing wait for news. It's been eight hours since the capsize and Maureen has no idea if her missing daughter, Teresa, has survived. She repeatedly asks hospital staff and reporters if there's any word. Then the hospital chaplain arrives with news. I have good news. I just heard that she's alive. She's well. Oh, my God. Oh, I was so pleased. I cried, and we, we were so, so pleased. Against all the odds, Teresa survived for an hour in the freezing water. She has serious injuries, but makes a full recovery. Her boyfriend, Mark, was also rescued in time. News of the disaster flashes around the globe. Drama at sea. A massive rescue effort is underway tonight off the coast of Belgium as hundreds of passengers aboard a capsized ferry boat are missing in frigid waters of the English Channel. The scale of the disaster shocks the world. Early reports put the death toll at 150, making it the worst peacetime British maritime accident since the sinking of the Titanic in 1912. As dawn breaks, stories emerge of miraculous survival and heroic actions by passengers and crew. One man acts as a human bridge so that others can escape. A truck driver rescues a five-year-old girl whose whole family are lost. The disaster is unimaginable. How could a modern 8,000-ton vessel sailing in perfect conditions capsize in only 90 seconds, just over a kilometer out of port? As the Herald is a British vessel, the UK government's Department of Transport hires the investigators. Ian Dan, one of Britain's leading naval architects, has been investigating marine accidents for 32 years. The scale of this tragedy shocks him. I think this was one of the worst disasters that I've ever had anything to deal with because there were people who had walked on board that ferry and within 20 minutes of the ferry leaving port, they were fighting for their lives. Dan must find out exactly what happened on the night of March 6th to ensure that such a catastrophe never happens again. Now, by rewinding the events of that fateful night and by going deep into the investigation, we can reveal what really caused the Herald of Free Enterprise to capsize. Advanced computer simulation will take us where no camera can go, into the heart of the disaster zone. 
The day after the tragedy, investigators take a boat out of the capsized Herald. It's a shocking sight. The ship appears to be intact. On the ship's visible side, they see no immediate sign of collision or damage. But what they see at the Herald's bow astounds them. The huge bow doors that allow vehicles on and off the ferry are wide open. It's clear to the investigators that water must have poured through these gaping doors. The media dubbed the open bow doors the doors of death. Ian Dad's team need to find out why the doors are open. We thought at the time that perhaps she might have hit something, which would, of course, have capsized. Or she could possibly have got very close to one bank or other of the approach channel to Zeebrugge. The team know that the Herald came to rest on a sandbar about one kilometer from the harbor entrance. There are several of these underwater obstructions just outside Zeebrugge. To avoid them, ships follow a marked channel 900 meters wide that port authorities keep clear by constant dredging. So did the Herald collide with the sandbar, causing fatal damage to her bow doors? Investigators discover that the Zeebrugge Port Authority routinely tracks all ferries by radar up to about three kilometers from the harbor. It shows the Herald going off course in her final moments, but the radar data reveals that she doesn't hit the sandbar. In fact, as she capsizes, she settles onto it. The ship veers off course because she was already in trouble. The sandbar is not a nemesis, but a savior. It stops the ship turning turtle, saving many lives. Investigators realize the theory that the bow doors were damaged by a collision is a dead end. Herald of Free Enterprise. They interview Port Authority personnel on duty the night of the disaster. It gives them a new lead. Port controller Guido de Ruder relates a strange report he received from the captain of the dredger Sanderus 20 minutes after the Herald left port. They told me that uh, he could see lights and he thought that the bow doors were still open, that he could see cars and trucks through the bow doors. It's staggering news. It appears to investigators that the Herald actually left port and set out to sea without closing her bow doors. How could this happen? To find out, they questioned surviving crew members who worked on the car deck that night. They learned that it's the job of First Officer Leslie Sable to supervise the loading of vehicles. It's also his responsibility to get the Herald loaded swiftly so that it can depart on time. If he fails, he could be reprimanded by his bosses. It was such a difficult market to make a lot of money in, and of course uh, one uh, got commercial success by uh, turning the vessels around very quickly. 30 minutes to disaster. The team discover that tonight, Sable is under pressure. The cheap ticket deal means the car deck will be full. As the last car rolls onto the ship, the call is announced for harbour stations. Stations, all stations. Herald of Free Enterprise, back to the harbour, proceeding outwards. This is the signal for crew to go to their positions for departure. Lee Cornelius's final duty on the car deck is to put a safety chain across the bow doors. First Officer Leslie Sable hurries to the bridge then are five minutes behind schedule. He is the last to leave the lower deck. Harbor stations is also the signal to close the bow doors using a hydraulic control lever on the car deck. 
Investigators discover the responsibility for this crucial job falls to assistant boatswain Mark Stanley. But when they question Mark Stanley about his actions that night, they're in for a shock. When he should be on the car deck closing the bow doors, Mark Stanley is still asleep in his cabin. He took a nap after the ship docked in Zeebrugge, but slept through the call for harbor stations. But the investigators are puzzled. Why does no other crew member notice that the bow doors are wide open and raise the alarm? They learn that who closes the doors and when is a hit and miss affair, as crew member Lee Cornelius recalls. Sometimes when we left and completed loading, one of the guys on the main deck would shut the bow doors. But that night we didn't, we just left them open and expected Mark to come and shut them when we'd finished. The bow doors are left open because the assistant bosun is asleep and on this night, no one else does the job for him. The investigators find that there is no fail-safe system for closing the bow doors. Although it's Mark Stanley's job to shut them, it should be double-checked by First Officer Leslie Sable. But in the race to stay on schedule, it was normal practice for the first officer to leave the car deck before the doors were closed. The officer who was to have done this checking had to also at that time be on the bridge, so he had to be in two places at once, which of course was impossible. Dand and his team discover another major flaw in the system. The captain cannot easily see the bow doors from the bridge. So unless a crew member tells him otherwise, he automatically assumes they are closed. Twenty-three minutes to disaster. Captain Lurie backs out of berth 12. He's totally unaware that no one has closed the five-meter bow doors on the car deck. It's clear to investigators that a combination of human error and poor systems causes the Herald to sail with her bow doors open. But this shocking discovery still doesn't solve the mystery of the Herald's capsize. One of the big puzzles was how so much water could get onto the vehicle deck when it was you know, 10, 11 feet above the calm sea level. It would take thousands of tons of water to capsize a ship the size of the Herald. But the bow doors to her car deck are sighted nearly three and a half meters above the waterline. Investigators suspect that in calm seas, they should be well beyond the reach of any waves. Then they discover that four years before, the Herald's sister ship set sail from Dover with her bow doors open. And yet she survived without incident. It confirms their suspicions. Even with her doors open, the Herald should have made it safely across the channel. So why didn't she? Investigator Ian Dand starts to explore what could reduce the clearance between bow doors and waterline. He discovers that the short loading ramp at Zeebrugge causes a problem. It's not long enough to reach the Herald's upper car deck. So Captain Lurie must fill a ballast tank in the bow with seawater to lower the Herald to the right level. This makes the ship sit one meter lower in the water at the bow. The operation reduces the clearance between bow doors and waterline to 2.5 meters. Zeebrugge Harbor is relatively shallow, just 15.5 meters deep. 
Sand has a hunch that this plays a role. As the ship sails, her movement creates low pressure under the hull that sucks the bow downward. In deep water, the effect is small, but when Dan runs tests, he discovers the effect is much greater in shallow water. As the water is forced through the narrow gap between ship and seabed, it rushes out from under the hull faster. This surge of water creates an area of low pressure under the ship, dragging it down even further. As the Herald sails on March 6th, the clearance between her open bow doors and the waterline is just 1.5 meters. Sailing in this condition would be risky, but investigators are not convinced it would be enough to cause the capsize. So how did so much water get onto the Herald's car deck? There's only one way for them to find out. Berth 12, Zeebrugge Harbour, May 10th, 1987. Nine weeks after the loss of the Herald, Ian Dand begins a crucial experiment aboard her sister ship, the Pride of Free Enterprise. He is set to restage the Herald's final fateful journey. The Pride is identical to the Herald. She's weighted with the same amount of ballast. The weather and tidal conditions are the same. The Pride maneuvers through Zeebrugge Harbor at a normal departure speed of 10 to 15 knots. Her bow doors stand 1.5 meters clear of the waterline, just like the Herald. As she sails, she creates a wave at the bow, but it breaks well below the bow doors. Next, Dan wants to see how high the bow wave gets as the ship accelerates. A bank of video cameras capture the wave from every angle. At 16.9 knots, the wave crests safely below the bow doors, rolling away from the ship. Then, Dan instructs the skipper to increase the speed. The ship is now sailing at 17.4 knots. The acceleration has an immediate effect. Not only does the bow wave increase, but it also changes direction. Instead of rolling forwards, the wave splashes back up towards the bow doors. Compelling, but not conclusive. The wave is only 2.5 meters, still not big enough to flood the car deck. Dan believes the Herald was sailing faster when she left port. He ups the speed half a knot to 18 knots, the maximum permitted speed. Suddenly, the wave balloons wildly. It is now almost four meters high, big enough to engulf the bow doors. On the Herald, water would be cascading straight onto the car deck. I was horrified to see the amount of water that came over the bow of the Herald on the full-scale trial. Dand is an experienced naval architect, but he has never seen a bow wave behave in this way. He turns to computer and physical models to try to explain the phenomenon. And he finds that once again, the shallow waters of Zeebrugge's harbor hold the key. Like all ships, the Herald throws up a bigger bow wave in shallow water than she does in deep water. It's called shallow water effect. The effect gradually becomes greater as the ship increases her speed. But the models confirm that when the Herald reaches 18 knots, it triggers a step change. There is a huge leap in the size of the bow wave. Just half a knot of extra speed, combined with Zeebrugge's shallow harbor, makes the critical difference. 
course, one of the big tragedies of the Herald is had it not been in the, that um, comparatively shallow water uh, coming out of Zeebrugge, it might have um, got away with having the bow doors open for quite a long period of time and uh, people might have spotted that they were open and closed them. Instead, the bow wave of almost four metres surges straight through the open doors. Dan calculates that 2,000 tonnes of water flood onto the Herald's car deck in about 30 seconds. Even this much water shouldn't sink such a large ship. What is the fatal weakness in the Herald's design that makes her capsize in just 90 seconds? Investigator Ian Dan has proved that 2,000 tonnes of water flooded onto the Herald's car deck. He knows that even this much water shouldn't be enough to sink a large ship. That's because traditionally, ships are divided into watertight compartments below the waterline. But the Herald's design is different. She has a huge open car deck with no dividing walls, so vehicles can easily drive on and off. It allows quick turnarounds at port in what is a highly competitive market. But the Herald's greatest commercial strength ends up being her downfall. Investigators calculate that with 2,000 tons of water rushing around her car deck, the Herald would become unstable very quickly. As the Herald sails, she naturally rocks from side to side. The water surges to the lowest point, making the ship tilt. At first, the ship's huge buoyancy allows her to recover. Water is rather an unstable entity and would rush to one side or the other of the vehicle deck, acting like a sort of pendulum, if you like. With each swing, the water surges more violently, causing the ship to tilt more steeply. Eventually, the ship reaches a point where she's unable to recover. Rian Dand and his team, it's the final crucial piece of evidence. Now they can piece together the precise chain of events that left the passengers and crew of the Herald of Free Enterprise seconds from disaster. Four minutes to disaster. Unaware that the bow doors are wide open, Captain Lurie ups the Herald's speed half a knot to 18 knots. In the shallow water of Zeebrugge's harbor, this makes the bow wave dramatically bigger. 90 seconds to disaster. 2,000 tons of water flood the ship's open car deck. 60 seconds to disaster. As the water surges across the car deck, passengers feel a violent lurch. Now the wave starts to carry cars and trucks with it. 30 seconds to disaster. The ship tilts 30 degrees to the left. It's the point of no return. The ship turns on her side to lie half submerged in the icy waters of the North Sea. Seven weeks after the tragedy, salvage tugs tow the Herald to port. The final death toll is 193, including 38 crew members. The investigator's final report finds that the Herald's loss is largely down to human error. Captain David Lurie is suspended for a year. First Officer Leslie Sable for two years. And the man who failed to close the bow doors, Assistant Boson Mark Stanley, is found seriously negligent but escapes further punishment. The report finds that ultimately, poor management by the Herald's owner Townsend Torreson is to blame. The British Department of Transport hits the company with a £400,000 fine. For survivors like Simon Osborne, the night on the Herald of Free Enterprise still casts a long shadow. The worst aspect of the whole thing was losing my, my two friends. You don't expect to lose two close friends at, at that age. I got to meet their parents and talk to them about the day that we'd had, you know to go to their funerals and memorial services. They were just 
they were just emotionally draining uh, experiences for an 18, 19 year old guy. Survivors Michael and Maureen Bennett find the disaster has transformed their outlook on life. If we want to go down the beach, we go today. We don't go tomorrow because tomorrow never comes. It only never came for us on that ferry. So we do things when we want to do them now. Their daughter Teresa too knows how close the family came to tragedy. There wasn't many families where all of them went and all of them came back, so we are really lucky to be alive. The disaster led to a major rethink of safety measures on British car ferries. Closed circuit TV cameras now allow captains to see the bow doors from the bridge. And indicators also tell them when the doors are closed. Shipping companies must modify their vessels to improve stability with features such as dividing bulkheads. It means that if a ship takes on water, it must be able to survive for at least 30 minutes without capsizing. The Herald of Free Enterprise disaster was a wake-up call to the maritime industry. The safety regulations it prompted have set a new high standard for the world to follow. Seconds from Disaster returns at the same time tomorrow. After the break, we examine the legacy of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. It'll be his second crossing of the day. By 5 p.m., cars and trucks are starting to roll onto the Herald's lower car deck through her giant bow doors. A cut-price ticket deal means the ship will be at capacity tonight and the crew have just one hour to complete loading. Once the lower deck is full, the crew must load the upper car deck. But there's a problem. The loading rabbit Zeebrugge doesn't reach the upper car deck. To reduce the gap, the captain must lower the ship in the water. He does this by pumping seawater into her ballast tanks. After 30 minutes, the ship sits one meter lower in the water. Only now can loading of the upper deck begin. The cheap ticket deal means the ship is packed with passengers too. Tonight, there are 459 on board. 5.30 p.m. Mike. The English Channel, the world's busiest shipping lane. Every day, tens of thousands cross it by ferry. It's a safe, routine trip. Until one ship capsizes just over a kilometer outside port. Within 90 seconds, hundreds of people are fighting for their lives in the icy water. 193 die in Britain's worst maritime accident since the Titanic. Now, with advanced computer simulations, we reveal exactly what went wrong on the Herald of Free Enterprise. Disasters don't just happen, they're a chain of critical events. <laughs> Belgium, Zeebrugge. Ferries from England and Germany sail in and out Hill and Maureen Bennett, their 20-year-old daughter Teresa and her boyfriend make their way home after a day out by the seaside. Teresa arranged the outing to mark a special family occasion for her mother and father. It was our wedding anniversary on the 1st of April and Teresa thought it'd be nice to, to take us out. We walked along the Ostend Harbour, uh, all around the lovely shops there. We really had a smashing time over there. Five forty-five p.m. Fifteen minutes to departure. The crew struggles to load the upper car deck in time. First officer Leslie Sable is in charge of loading and he's feeling the heat. 
turnarounds are so tight that even a short hold up here could throw out the Herald's schedule for subsequent crossings. Crew member Lee Cornelius is hard at work. It's always a bit of a rush at the end. Cars turn up just before you sail in and fill the ship up. Five fifty seven this bustling North Sea port every day. March sixth, nineteen eighty seven. A chilly winter's day. The Herald of Free Enterprise, an 8,000-ton car and passenger ferry owned by the European shipping company Townsend Torreson, arrives from Dover. She's made the four-and-a-half-hour journey across the English Channel safely thousands of times. The Herald is on a tight schedule. She must complete four crossings every day. And between each trip, her crew must offload passengers and vehicles, clean the ship, and then reload for the next trip, all in the space of 90 minutes. Today, the Herald is just barely staying on schedule. 4 p.m. Assistant bosun Mark Stanley finishes up cleaning the car deck, ready for the return trip to England. He's been on duty for more than five hours, but will get an hour-long break before the ship sails for home. While the Herald's crew works hard, her passengers savor the last hours ashore, enjoying the shops, restaurants, and cheap alcohol of continental Europe. <laughs> Most are British tourists, like 19-year-old bartender Simon Osborne. He's on a day trip to Belgium with a group of friends. We spent the afternoon on a pub crawl, you know, from bar to bar around our standard. It was a really good day, a good, a good lads day out. They order one last round of drinks. Soon, they'll be leaving to sail home on the Herald. Four thirty p.m. Assistant bosun Mark Stanley completes his duties and heads to a crew cabin for his break. He won't be needed on the car deck again until just before the ship sails at 6 p.m. On the bridge, the Herald's captain, David Lurie, who has 10 years' experience commanding ships. He double-checks his route home across the channel. 